Good afternoon um, from myself here in New Zealand. Welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about overusing natural strengths and of course blind spots that it can create. We all have them at every level but for leaders it's even more vital as there's actually a huge expectation for them to act and be in a certain way when they're under pressure or in, in certain situations. As you will be well aware, we all have blind spots in our behaviours. So yes, that means leaders do have them too. Uncovering these blind spots through feedback from peers, direct reports, as well as building stronger self-awareness in the first place, is pretty important for leaders these days to understand. It's important to discover or be aware of what might really be holding them back. You know, we're going to have a look at the extended DISC uh, assessments today, but also the FINKS 360 feedbacks. Um, these are two amazing tools, and I use them a lot, but they are really great for helping leaders, or anyone for that matter, to understand their unique strengths, development areas, and yep, you've got it, those tricky overuse and blind spots. You know, we've all had it or even we've heard it or had it. We've all had an experience where a manager or a leader uses a particular natural trait they have far too much. And it starts to become a problem. My experience is that years ago, I had a manager that was really friendly, easy to talk to. He was spontaneous and informal. So much, he was actually right part of our group. He was so friendly with us and a lot of fun to be around. And that was great. You know, he was really encouraging as a leader. And he was happy to chat at any time. So you could interrupt him, which was pretty cool from my point of view. The problem was that his leadership style felt really cool to start off with. Bit of a dude. But after a few months, some of his ways really started to irritate me and also the other team members. So as a result, I stopped trying to engage with him as much, which meant communication fell away. There were vibes, all sorts of things started to happen. The point was, it wasn't just me that felt like this. In fact, the majority of the team did, and some people in the team actually ended up leaving. The reason being is that they felt they didn't respect him enough to work with him. You know, but honestly, he was such a nice guy, and he really meant well. So let me explain a bit further. You know, he seemed to be so chatty that he often interrupted us, as I said. You know, he joined in randomly when we were having personal chats, so kind of like he had FOMO. Or actually, if I was truthful, he came around and actually interrupted us a lot when we were trying to work. You know, after being interrupted, a lot of us struggled to refocus and we knew our productivity was down and mistakes were being made. It was also the length of time he talked for. I always felt that there was a, you know, a natural time or a lull in the conversation when it was appropriate to go back to work. And it, for whatever reason, he seemed to miss this. He would end up telling us long-winded stories about himself. Even the conversations would start to be only about him. In fact, the focus would be stolen away from the other person that initiated the story back to him. Don't get me wrong, he was a great guy and he was, had great stories for the main part, as he was quite inspiring as well with his delivery. But it was annoying that it was happening so much over and over. So the natural reaction, as I said before, was to not catch his eye, not engage, and we all started to avoid him. I couldn't believe he didn't notice this. You know, when I most noticed the impact he had on us was really when we were under the pump, under pressure of things like deadlines or targets. He often became quite frantic and hectic, elevated as we used to call it. He forgot a lot of commitments as he didn't write them down. He'd lose paperwork for meetings or just not be ready for them. He wouldn't follow simple processes that he'd put in place or the organisation had put in place to keep the workflow going. The worst one was scheduling and planning seemed to go out the window and any internal meetings were spur of the moment and verbal downloads, so we weren't really able to prepare ourselves. Or worse, add ideas, opinions to decisions he was making. Here's another observation. He also got loud. He spoke faster when he was under pressure. Still very caring, probably a bit too people focused really, but a lot of the tasks went by the wayside. Directions, planning fell away. All of this happened and he was blissfully under, unaware of how he was being perceived by his team. I know he felt he was caring, enthusiastic, communicative with all of us, 
but people started to leave when people sorry when people started to leave he was really hurt genuinely hurt and unfortunately became pretty defensive about the blame game as he felt he wasn't the one to blame after all he was being really humane really people focused was he yep he was but just far too much you know my little story there you can pretty much guess yes he's an i style under pressure and this is what I was talking about, overusing strengths and being unaware of them. So here's the thing. It's pretty typical that we all overlook our natural strengths when looking at development. As a rule, when we tend to focus on things we aren't good at or struggling to do, um, we, and we, we focus on those things that we're not good at and we try to improve those. And that's not bad, of course, if there's something hindering us and needs to be improved. The issue is then that we don't always look or even acknowledge our strengths. We tend to pat ourselves, we, sorry, we don't tend to pat ourselves on our backs for what we naturally do well. Which is actually a really real shame because actually I implement a lot of strength-based development programs and obviously it's easier to develop strength or, or um, areas that you're strong at than it is to develop weaknesses. But obviously it has to be in balance. So what this means is because we do something naturally well, we often assume others can do the same thing well. So we don't see it as a strength that we have. Then we get annoyed at the other person when they don't measure up to the same aspect. But as we know from understanding disc knowledge, this couldn't be further from the truth. Many of the other styles do not share the same strengths and actually might not see the same value in them either, which is, a, which is a real priority to remember, value in those strengths. Again, think of an I style that can go and chat to anyone and engage in lighthearted banter naturally with people versus a C style that might not want to go and interrupt people, let alone strangers to chat about surface stuff. It's just not their priority. They are too busy focusing on the task to get ticked off and working rather than working a room in their eyes is just not on the radar or of priority usually. Okay, so, you know, we all have those different strengths and we all know using our strengths is a lot easier. Okay, it's comfortable. It's all, it's in our comfort zone. It's human nature to stay in our comfort zone. Straying out of them often means modifying our behaviours, using energy to think or having to put more effort in to push ourselves to do something. It's far nicer to be on autopilot than it is um, to, you know, to use the energy trying something new. It's far more likely that we tend to stay in our comfort zone and emphasise overuse of these behaviours that are natural to us. In fact, these strengths are so comfortable when we use them, we find them motivating even, and that's where the trouble can come. It can cause us to overuse them because it feels easy and nice. So in a simple way, Extended Disc sums us up quite nicely by saying, when we overuse our strengths, essentially we become too much of ourselves. As a result, others around us are not going to respond well to our behavior. So if we are under pressure, fatigue, have strong emotions or stress like I described in the story earlier about my manager, the behavioural overuse traits really do come out and can be seen by others. In stress, we tend to revert to our natural disc style, away from any adaption that we're doing, usually, and we amplify what's easy and accessible to us. Of course, our strengths but too much of any trait is going to elicit reactions from others. And that's where this miscommunication and conflict can be born. But here's the thing, we don't just revert to our strengths. We tend to start exhibiting the negative traits of those strengths from our disc style. And guess what? These are not usually the most appropriate to be using in the situation. Yep, you've all seen it. Worse, you've all done it. So, I'm going to be having a look at those um, particular strengths in a moment, but here, here's a question. What can we do to avoid overusing our strengths? Well, as I'm pointing out, being self-aware of strengths as much as other specific development areas should be a priority to you or any development pro program. 
But at the end of the day, being self-aware comes down to making conscious choice about modifying your behavior. And because modifying our behavior takes energy and effort, there are times we really just don't feel like it. We might be too tired or angry or just not motivated to adapt ourselves for the better. I guess this is a crucial point to ask yourself, what will the outcome be if I don't make the effort? Is the cost worth the effort? Removing yourself from the situation to think or process is one way to do this. and It often helps to give you a better perspective again. If you want to avoid overusing strengths when we are stressed, bring the subconscious into the conscious and be aware of what you are doing and saying in the present. You know, I'm a great believer in learning the typical overuse areas that our styles tend to have. Make it knowledge. You know, knowledge is power. That way, you know, you can help hone down and focus on something that you might not be overusing. And yes, have a blind spot. We'll talk about blind spots soon. So in the heat of the moment, when issues are going on, take a breath, be mindful of how you're acting, what you're saying. You know, for me, I try to get an umbrella picture of myself as a perspective and rate the way I'm interacting. If you're feeling out of control and overly emotional, as I's tend to do, or intolerant and explosive, like D's tend to be, then it's going to be pretty difficult for you to adjust your behavior for the situation. At the end of the day, it's analyzing the end goal. Is the cost of um, not making the effort to evaluate yourself and adapt outweigh the cost of fixing up the problems you can cause with overusing strengths in the first place? Only you can answer that, I guess. So I, talk, I mentioned before about something called blind spots. You know, just to clarify, blind spots in a nutshell are literally the disconnect between how you view yourself versus how others might view you. There are gaps in the self-awareness um, area, and those are what we call blind spots. It doesn't happen very often, but at times I've seen someone really not resonate with an aspect of their DISC report, yet others around them are agreeing wholeheartedly with nodding, saying, oh, yes, you do. You know, there are times that that person's report is, is, is a really a surprise to them and, um, and how the report or others are describing them, they're, they're quite astonished. You know, it's no surprise that how you view your behaviours is not always how others view them. When, when there's a gap between the two views, it can cause miscommunication and hinder your interactions. We may even make assumptions that everyone operates the same way we do. In fact, we do make assumptions in that very area. So for example, if you're totally focused on launching a product fast, for example, then everyone else must have the exact same belief, surely, don't they? Our own disc style and perceptions give value filters to the behaviors we observe in others. And as you know, they are all different. We value behaviors differently. So the more knowledge you have about yourself, including you know, a good start, DISC framework, the more self-awareness you acquire, it also then will help you understand others and how others see you. The result could mean removing your blind spots, and this is a pretty important role for a leader. You know, the, the, the more you can remove those blind spots, the more you can adapt yourself and modify yourself for the different types of people around you. The more self-awareness you have, the, the, the more control you have over the situations as well. So let's just take a quick look now. Um, I, I always love this slide. So we're going to just start with the D, I, S and C. And you know, a good majority of you will understand this slide and you would have seen it before. But it, this really helps me with um, the 360s that we'll be looking at. But it really helps me debrief as well. Because if there's things going on, it's really interesting to be able to ask people about overusing strengths. And of course, the blind spots are pretty apparent when you do go down that discussion track. So let's start with good old D. You know, usually their traits that we describe them as is decisive, strong, determined, demanding, self-confident, etc. When they're overusing, so under pressure, fatigued, tired, they can often become aggressive, blunt, controlling. The whole idea is that they actually become fairly intolerant. 
overbearing and often exceed authority. I mean, I've seen that happen myself. And, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a great way to function because people can be quite um, fearful of the outcome or going, the communication flow definitely gets stemmed as well. Let's have a look at the good old um, I style. So we would describe them as sociable, talkative, open, enthusiastic, energetic, and persuasive. A bit like the story that I just described to you before, my, that, that old boss that I had definitely became flamboyant, frantic, careless, indiscreet, excitable, hasty, loser sense of time. I mean, turning up to meetings with wrong paperwork, um, ad hoc behavior when it came to um, go, having meetings internally, just not giving us a chance to prepare or have opinions. And, you know, I'm a quite a spontaneous person because I'm an I style myself. But imagine what others felt like that were S and C that needed planning time. Um, you know, there were some pretty big clashes coming up through his style of overuse and lack of awareness. Um, S style we know is calm, steady, careful, patient. You know, they're great listeners, modest and trustworthy. Here's the thing, under pressure, under stress, they tend to, their hardwire, they, what they fall back onto tends to be, they resist new ideas, they can become quite docile or plodding, they, become, they can become very stubborn and very reliant on um, people around them or asking questions to managers. So I, um, a nice way to say it is um, initiative, that, that can get cut as well. And they can react quite, quite a lot to change by being stubborn as well. So there's a few overuse areas for the S. Let's have a look at the last one. You'll see comp the compliance. They tend to be precise. They follow rules, logical, careful, formal, and disciplined. In their overuse, they're going to exhibit things like being withdrawn, cold, like you might say, gosh, they're really aloof. They're not interacting with people. Indecisive when it comes to decisions, get stuck in the details. They can become um, cold and quite suspicious of people. And um, it's very noticeable. So look, we all have different overuse areas. But what I love is that you can learn some of this about yourselves. I mean, on, granted, this is down into only four styles. And I know extended disc goes into 360 different styles. But by utilizing your report, there's also some really good information in there about how potentially you could overuse situations as well. So, you know, DISC is a fabulous way of starting a self-awareness journey. However, there's an addition to this, and many of you would already know or may even be using it, but you know I love this particular report. You know, leaders don't get a typical Typically, well, they don't typically get a lot of genuine feedback. And it's usually feedback in situations where something's come to a head. So it's usually something gone wrong. And of course, without feedback, there is always a distinct possibility that they can invent their own perception of their performance, which in reality might be incredibly different to others, hence the reason of my story. This is the blind spot that I've been mentioning. So if we receive effective and constructive feedback in the form of a Open360 feedback report, it can provide vital information that lets us know, not only know how we are actually doing, but also gives us a general direction and for growth and, and what we can do about it. So, um, you know, the idea of a 360, or sorry, I shorten it to 360, is that it happens, you know, it uses and measures skills, competencies, and behaviors of the individual. So it's not disc-based, it's, it measures skills, competencies, and behaviors. It combines an individual's self-assessment and feedback from different groups like their peers, direct reports, and managers, and puts it all into one report. So some of the areas I use these reports in is things like performance appraisals and leadership evaluations and definitely employee development programs. But as you can see above, there are so many different areas for it as well. So I really urge you to, you know, have a look over that and see whether you are able to implement it into the programs that you run, both as consultants or in corporate environment. You know, just to reiterate for a moment, they, the 360s don't just have to be for leaders, leadership, but it certainly should be part of a leadership program. 
The results are usually presented um, anonymously so that people answering it feel really safe in their replies. Obviously though, for that reason, you do need to have say more than four people answering or four to five people answering um, in each area, or say each area in the report. So the, the more the merrier, but obviously um, some of the ones that I've done uh, are around about eight or nine people answering, and that creates a really well-rounded report. So the idea of the Open360 report is to facilitate open and transparent dialogue with the person on specific aspects that get reported back. The report itself is divided into question groups, so it's pretty easy to work through in a really structured way. Let's have a look at that. So just a quick note, there are different types of 360 questionnaires available to you. So if you aren't familiar with them, then contact HR Profiling as they can set you on the right track for what to use. Or if you're like me, I simply develop my own questionnaire with a company uh, with some specifics in mind. Most companies I work with tend to download a template of a 360 that's near enough, and from there we modify it. At least it just gives a backbone to start with. So same as the presenting of the results in the 360, you can use different charts and tables. Really, it's just your own preference. So where I'm coming to with this is, you know, the thing I love what the most is actually you can produce on top of all this a blind spot report. And man, that tells me so much information. So the blind spot report helps me to understand the difference in perspective of the, of the different groups. It takes all the answering groups, except for the self-assessment, and averages it out, and then it compares it to the person, uh, the self. So again, just to reiterate, it takes all the groups, puts them together, gets an average, and then it compares it separately to the self. You know, it helps, it helps to look at um, perspective and if there's any perspective out of alignment. As you can see on this slide, it makes it go red when the standard deviation goes past a set point, meaning that there's too much difference in that particular question or statement. As a consultant, it's my job to look at this and work out why there is a difference and what can be done about it. Just to note though, all because something is green in the blind spot report does not mean that it's not a development area. All it means is just that all the parties have the same perspective on it. Red or yellow means there's some discrepancy in it. Obviously red more so, like on the screen here. Um, HR profiling can arm you with a really good guide on how to read the results and what it means. Um, it's really worth getting it, to be honest, because there's some really great tips and tricks for facilitating and guiding a 360 feedback, including a um, chart with minus and negative results, uh, sorry, minus negative and positive results and what they actually mean. So what I've been finding really successful lately though in my leadership programs is to pair up a leadership disc assessment and also use this great 360 report and blind spot. I find it gives me so much information about what is happening. It pinpoints the overuse areas, blind spots, but it also helps to give me a why when I relate it back to the DISC report. You know, this can open up so much healthy, robust discussion about perspective, overuse, but it also brings it back to the, the why, which is the hardwired behavior. Trust me, it keeps you busy for quite a while examining and guiding through that. So as I say, look, that guide, that H guide book that HR profiling has really gives you some answers for how to, how to do this. But for this simple webinar, it's just a matter of understanding that we do have um, strengths that are overlooked. We overuse them, which is pretty common. There's a lot of, self, um, I guess, lack of self-awareness, especially in leadership, because we are looking at them more specifically and we do expect a lot more from them. Um, with, with using 360s in the blind spot reports, we can actually target and hone in this particular development area and really focus on a development path. Um, if, so look, if you want some more information about anything that I've talked about today, 
HR profiling would be very happy to send you guides or talk to you about it. There's some great information on their new website, looking great HR profiling by the way, and um, have a little read through that and see whether it's something that you could put in your program. It's definitely wonderful for the yearly employee appraisals. It's definitely helpful for uh, leadership information development programs. But I do really say to you, try and couple it with DISC because it really does make sense to look at why things are happening and how they've got, have got there. Also too, why the person um, is answering like they did because it's, the other day I had uh, 360 done uh, implemented and the person we were answering about was an S style leader and the pers people that were quite forward about um, the, his leadership style was a D and a C style. It, it, there was some issues there and that's where the bright reds came out. But if I didn't understand, if I hadn't disked some of that team, I wouldn't have understood as much about the C and the D style behaviours and what they may have needed and why it was happening. So have a look and see if you can incorporate it together in a program. Um, and as I say, HR profiling would be very happy to give you some guidelines on how to do that. Hey, thanks for listening, everyone. And the, this, this webinar will go up online very shortly uh, on the YouTube channel or onto the HR profiling website. So feel free to send through any questions to Courtney and the team. And I will talk to you next month. Bye.